Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Now we will move on to our next session. And uh, it is my great honor and uh, privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker today, Professor Manush Roy. Uh, Manush Roy is a professor of cultural studies at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. He works at the interface of political theory and cultural studies and has published on, wide, on a wide spectrum of areas, including Marxism, ethics, governmentality, postmodernism, field theory, continental political philosophy, and memory and locality in post partition uh, Calcutta. He has held visiting positions in Berlin, Paris, Edinburgh, Amsterdam, and Cape Town. Today he will speak on understanding partition, the culture and the Thank you, Aditi and Kalen. It's, of course, a matter of great honor to be offered to give this talk. And, uh, well, I mean, what I have today is actually not so much of a, of a paper. Uh, I think it can be characterized as something like an approach paper. Uh, by which I mean, I am actually going to get into a dialogue with myself as much as I would with all of you. Because it takes a retrospective view of this enormous literature on partition that started happening from the late 90s, you know, particularly when independent India till 50. So over these 20 years, there has been a real proliferation of literature. I'm going to take a bird's eye view of that and try to locate, you know, the contours of this literature, but more importantly, where all more work needs to be done. You know, which are the the silent spaces as it were that remain. So let me let me get straight to my paper. It's a longish paper, not very long, but I am a slow reader, so it's better I restrict myself to my paper. As I jot down my thoughts, two discrete events come to mind. The first was immediately after the 1984 Delhi curve. Then a student of JNU, I went along with some friends to witness firsthand the situation at Tirlok Puri. And you would know that this was one of the worst affected areas. And in post-emergency language, it was still known as trans jumuna Rehabilitation Project. When I reached there, the place still had a perched smell. Quite a few families living inside hydrants, traumatized faces everywhere. At some point, I felt thirsty and found out a tube well. I stood there waiting as a girl, barely seven or eight, filled up her bucket. She was too small to pump properly and had to raise her hands to get hold of the handle. Came a man, hefty, tall, tough, middle-aged. He waited for a few seconds for the girl to finish. Grew impatient, kicked the bucket away, looked at the girl piercingly. The girl kept pumping. He drank with folded palms and went away. That was immediately after those three days of violence and the smokes were yet to die. Standing in the midst of the rubbles, the scenario of violence and moaning didn't for a moment look all that extraordinary. The second event, not exactly an event, just a few articles, happened years later in 2005. 
I had gone to Dhaka for the first time. My parents were born there. A friend had lent his car and I went to visit the locality where my parents once lived. I had heard so much about it from childhood, as we, meaning the driver and I, were meandering through the narrow lanes of that locality, Gandharan, for those who are acquainted with Dhaka, you know, it's an old Dhaka. I told the driver, do you know, had the country not been partitioned, I would have grown up here. He asked me, what? I said, partition. What is that? Baffled, I impatiently explained. He said, now that you tell me, my mother had also said something similar. He used to say, at one point, these places would be teeming with the Hindus. So, why did you all leave? Exasperated, I asked him whether he had heard of the world, the 71 world. For the rest of the journey, he narrated the stories of the world he was brought up with. He was a man in his mid-thirties. For the man of the street, at least, the world has erased the partition, or perhaps the partition resides within the world. Nations have their own ways of dealing with memories of trauma. For the newly independent India, a project of silence seemed necessary for the project of the nation state. From my childhood memories of the early 60s, it seems to me that the Independence Day celebration referred more to the new nation than the severed, than the severed nation. In recent years, the more the national narrative of stability, growth, and state-sponsored secularism proved untenable, then um, the more has been the interest in the partition, taking it, if not as the original point, then at least the dividing line of our national life, a line that holds as if the secret of much of our present However, this is not to say that partition became part of academic discourse only from the 1990s. Big fat tones were being regularly churned out, probing into who was responsible, how could it have been possibly avoided, the big actors, the big story, the big picture of the big nation. The new kind of scholarship that emerged in the 1990s Initiated prominently by Urvoshi Kudalia, Ritu Menon, Kamla Vasin, Ganindu Pande, and Vina Das, started asking new kinds of questions. Questions which came with new epistemological assignments in history writing and cultural anthropology. How did people undergo the experience of partition as a group? as a family, as an individual. How did partition become part of ourselves? What does it mean to suffer? What it is to witness? What does it mean to be violated and raped and then have to live with those poisonous memories that cannot be shared even with very intimate relations? In short, the afterlife of pain and trauma. This scholarship paralleled, tied up, and at times drew intellectual sustenance from the emergence of a self-conscious discourse of memory in history writing, made possible by the Holocaust discourse and new trends in philosophy, namely post-structuralism. Over the past two decades, this new scholarship on the partition has grown in bulk as well as prestige, attracting some of the best writings in history and cultural anthropology, as well as other branches of social and human studies. Here, two disclaimers are in place. Even though there is a whole host of literary creative outputs, novels, short stories, poems, plays, and films, 
I will restrict my focus to how such materials have been used in critical discursive writings of the party. Second, the story of the partition at the two flanks of undivided India is in many ways two different affairs. On the western side, the transfer of population, Hindus and Sikhs from West Pakistan and Muslims from Indian Punjab was nearly total, immensely brutal, but nonetheless a one-time affair. The eastern part, in contrast, was a protracted scenario of border crossing happening in regular sparks since 1946 and continuing for decades to come. In 1971, what was East Pakistan gained independence after a year-long brutal war to form Bangladesh, but the border crossing never stopped. Correspondingly, the literature on partition, both literary and academic, is markedly different at the two ends. My presentation today concerns mostly the academic literature centering on the experience of partition, though there would be occasional references to experiences in the eastern side. But having said that, let me say, during question answer, I'm happy to take up questions on the eastern experience as well, to the extent they can. The movement of people across national borders in the wake of the partition is by any estimate the largest of such occurrences in the 20th century. The Western world responded with inertia and indifference in fact, the violence that accompanied the partition had a predictable afterlife to it, convincing the West of the necessity of its civilizing mission, even as the empire ceased to be. <clears throat> After the establishment of the Israeli state that provided home for the hounded Jewish people of Europe, as well as Jews from other parts of the world, there was no marked interest in the phenomenon of displacement in international academic circuits. The current interest in refugee studies have been triggered mainly by the crisis of post-Soviet Europe and ethnic conflicts in Africa, and in very recent times, the migrants to Europe from the Middle East. In the process, it has internationalized the refugee made her or him into an icon, an abstraction. Related by way of opposition is a demand for specificity. What is so specifically refugee about a particular life story, it would ask. Refugee, in this understanding, is a thesis, a will to knowledge that grills one's whole way of life. The two approaches are related since both reduce the refugee into an exotic figure. The partition, such is its narratological virtue, has the ability to be naturally part of a configuration of number of discourses, historical, psychoanalytic, fictional, journalistic, what have we. This privileging of partition as a central founding trope however, has its own problems. Either it easily lends itself to a metaphysics, where it is the emblem of the eternal story of displacement and resettlement, and I think this problem is not specific to partition only. Other studies of chronic sort of displacement or have it. That either it becomes the eternal story of displacement and resettlement, or it is viewed strictly as an empirical event that is irreducibly authentic, ontologically given, and immutably present. In the process, its permeability in humdrum everyday existence runs the risk of being lost from gaze. The scholarly literature I am, concerning, uh, I am concerned with here has gone a long way in addressing this issue. Here, in short, are the salient themes of the current research, and I'll name them. First is Holocaust and Partition, the limited experience. 
Second, emergence of a self-conscious discourse of memory in social sciences and humanities, a comparative assessment. Third, violence, trauma, and the texture of everyday life. Third, fourth, the paradox of witnessing. Fifth, museumizing the partition and the life of objects, which I call on the governance of memory. <clears throat> Holocaust and the partition, the limit experience. For the West, the paradigmatic moment of the crisis of mortality is the trauma of the Holocaust, which Pierre Nora characterized as the limit experience and thus somehow definitive of event rules. Reinhard Kuzelik, whom many of you might have heard, the philosopher of history, German philosopher of history of last century, has argued in his book critique and crisis, that Western modernity is hinged upon the notion of crisis. To make his point, Kozelek rewrote the concept to mean something entirely new. He viewed the origins of modernity as largely a response to a post-theological notion of crisis, that is, Europe after the Westphalia Pact. A secular medical notion of crisis of the social body combined with a sense of urgency borrowed from Christian notions of the last judgment and the apocalypse. In the medical sense, crisis is something that would continue to recur in the social body if the body process is allowed to continue in its present diseased manner. Suppose I have a viral infection. It will keep recurring unless I you know, administer the proper medicine. That is, in this case, it is structurally recurrent. Fine. While in the theological sense, a crisis is interpreted as involving a decision which, while unique, is above all final. Think of Schindler's List. There are many such examples. You know, the camping in inmates are passing by, and here is the camp guard with a gun, shoots down the seventh man. So then the fourteenth man thinks this is my turn, but he might be shooting down the twenty-third man again, or the one. So these decisions are both unique. You cannot guess the next decision from this one. At the same time, this is a final. So then, crisis put together in the new theological semantics of the term becomes a possible structural recurrence from the medical secular register, a possible structural recurrence, and also which is absolutely unique. In this sense, the concept of crisis, Kuzelek argued, can generalize the modern experience to such an extent that it becomes a permanent concept of Western mortality. Now, however, it is argued that the crisis that Holocaust represents defies all previous understandings of the term. From Solfrid Langer to Dominic Lacroix, from Mark Turdiman to Maurice Plachon, commentators are in overwhelming agreement that Holocaust slash Auschwitz is the final demonstration of history's inability to represent. In fact, in some writings, Auschwitz is the ultimate exposure of what Ashish Nundi in a different context calls the satanism of historical consciousness. Once again, the Western knowledge enterprise found in its own repository the reason for departure from a paradigm it had devised for itself and also for the rest of the world. Unlike history's myriad atrocities or even genocides, it has been argued Holocaust is a pure singularity, a radical disjuncture of comprehension as also of life as we know it to be. Claude Lanzmann, the director of the film Shaw, comments that Holocaust is, and I quote him, unique first of all in, in that it it erects around itself in a circle of flames 
a limit which cannot be breached because a certain absolute is intrans in intransmissible. To claim to do so is to make oneself guilty of the most serious sort of transgression." Unquote. However, alongside this metaphysical approach of incomprehensibility and finality, there is also a realistic mode of viewing the Holocaust pioneered by Hannah Arendt. In her Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the finality of evil, 1963, Arendt views Eichmann as a victim of a petty, unimaginative, bureaucratic rationalism, and thus tries to establish an everyday track route with a mammoth event like the Holocaust. Also interesting to investigate how, after 70 years, Holocaust remains an active memory amongst Jews and Israelis, a pivot for shaping their identities, though divergences about the meaning of the event and the way it is mobilized in public memory remains. From the very beginning, the Israeli state followed a three-tier commemoration policy, the Holocaust victims, but then along with this museums of resistance fighters as in Warsaw Ghetto, and finally the 18,000 young volunteers who died in the first decade of wars with the Arabs, the so-called War of Independence. The idea was to shift the meaning of Holocaust from victims, from victimhood to glorious resistance and give meaning to the death of six million European Jews. The psychological continuity between death in Holocaust and death in Israel's wars has given the stories framed by the Holocaust and the Warsaw Ghetto a cultural context. Thus, the memory of the Holocaust became meaningful to the Jews in Israel through their fears of annihilation by the Arabs. As Susan Sontag observed, Holocaust museums may effectively disallow recognition of the evil closer at home. Interestingly, despite the massive mobilization of Holocaust memories and the memories of War of Independence, Moral and political dilemmas started arising in Israeli citizens from the 1970s, especially after the Lebanon War, the Intifada, and the Gulf War of 1991. Doubts that struck at the heart of a unified nationalism. Israel's war against the people of Palestine has been increasingly alienating its younger generations, making the war effort look more like <clears throat> more a part of the pre turned predator syndrome. According around the same time as the emergence of the new partition studies came a whole cluster of new and defining studies on the Holocaust. This is very interesting. You know, precisely the same time from the early 90s came a new variant of interpretation of the Holocaust. And we have to now see, put those sort of writings and the writings that came in the late 90s and early 2000s to see where are the resemblances and the difference. And these writings are Saul Friedlanger's Memory History and the Extermination of Jews of Europe, 1993, Michael Roth's The Ironist Cage, 1995, and Dominic Lacapra's History and Memory after Auschwitz, 1998. Like the authors of these books, the commentators on the partition that I am concentrating on have no direct experience of partition violence, but are trying to come to terms with their parental generation's trauma and bereavement. <clears throat> the spate of writings on the partition since 1990s is both a takeover from and a challenge to the literature that assumes Auschwitz as the ultimate of eventfulness. It is related to the Holocaust in that it too is focused on excavating the memories of trauma, partition trauma that is, and views those memories so long buried under the tomb of history as the most radical moment of alterity that the history of the subcontinent 
in its prison guards cannot negotiate. It is also a challenge to the Holocaust discourse since it broadens the scope of the discourse much beyond the pale of geographical limits of <coughs> Europe and brings in squarely the predicament of colonialism into the purview of the new philosophical turn of history writing. However, partition studies, even in its new turn, has not engaged with any serious comparison of, with the violence of part, comparison between the violence of partition and of Holocaust, save a few fleeting comments. Ganinda Pandey, for instance, observes that the ideological role of partition historiography has been very different from that of Holocaust, but makes no efforts to explain it. There are others who maintain that particular histories of post-Holocaust Germany and post-partition India call for different approaches to the signal historical events. Yes, it might be true, but the issue is left unaddressed. It is true that any significant development of history is unique and non-generalizable. It is also true that comparison <coughs> It is also true that comparison among large-scale events of violence tend to get reduced to philosophical anthropology, that is, ultimately, the whatness of man. But, uh, but comparison does not simply mean similarities. It also involves differences. Here is a project waiting to be addressed, especially by drawing in the changes in the perception of this mammoth instances of violence over time and in keeping with the changing location of the nation state. Now the second aspect I want to deal with is the emergence of a self-conscious discourse of memory in social sciences and humanities, a comparative approach. After a meticulous and scholarly deliberation on what a nation is, Ernst Renan came to the conclusion that the nation was a soul with a past. The nation, he argued, was the end product of a long past of efforts, sacrifices, and devotions. Of all the cults, says Renan, that of the ancestors is the most legitimate. The ancestors have made us what we are today. The essential conditions of the people are, and I quote him, the common glories in the past and a common will in the present. Renan tied the meaning of the nation not to its language, biology, or territories, but to its historical memory, that rich legacy, as he says, of remembrances. Notably for Renan, memory is not merely memory of the dead, but memory is an act of a people having done great things together wanting to do them again. Forgetting and historical error are essential factors in the creation of a nation. Note here, for Renan, memory is essentially a matter of consolidation, ignoring the contestations that might be part of a nation's collective memory and a nation's present. Working on Renan's thesis, Pierre Nora, in an important article which most of you might have read, between history and memory, observes that memory as a, living as a lived experience and a fullness of being of communities have been hegemonized by modern rationalized methods of analyzing and preserving the past as public monuments and museums. Commenting on the modern public culture of commemoration, like museums, statues, and national festivities, Nora observes that these have come as a fixed, externalized locations of what was once an internalized social collective memory. However, the current flood of interest in personal and community memories that the Holocaust and then post-apartheid South African Truth Commission have triggered, you know, sponsoring a veritable memory industry, as it has been called, the great mass of autobiographies of pain, torture, and confessions, family genealogies, 
personal and group archives of photographs, diaries, letters, and used artifacts, or witnessing the struggle over statues of leaders of underprivileged communities in India. This claim of Nora does not stand unimpaired. Particularly untenable for our country is Nora's neat divide between pre- and post-industrial uses of memory. In a narrative culture like ours, memory is steeped in cultural religiosity. In our context, lying very close to the formal nation state is what can be called the people nation. No? that fuels the imagination of particularly the ordinary toiling masses and laboring castes. <clears throat> the partition archive is a fissure archive. For instance, one can cite the case of rumors which are by definition characterized by, as Ganendra Pandre calls them, indeterminacy, anonymity, and contagion, and marked by their sheer excess. Memory in this new academic discourse, though in active dialogue with what I am calling the people nation, needs to be understood in its methodological and philosophical justifications and specificities. Here, memory is a sign of an unincorporated remainder, an excess, both as well as neither identity nor or difference. If history's project is an attempt to reduce an already always plural to sameness, the counter posture of memory is to keep this plurality alive by considering that which cannot be thought in history. Hence the interest in marginalia of history and also in extraordinary dislocating experiences like trauma, particularly white skin trauma. It is crucial for our project that we consider the particular disjunctions that our history, meaning our colonial history, has gone through. The independence from the British rule that came after a long, popular, and difficult nationalist movement also meant the banishment of a vast number of people from the homeland. Correspondingly, and this point is important, space as a matter of cultural struggle the specific mix of geography and historical memory, with all the overlapping memories, narratives, and physical structures, is both more poignant and alienatory. The relationship between material spaces and imaginary spaces of memory <coughs> is one that is rendered opaque as well as transparent by forces of representation. Here is. The, the kind of trick about representation. The will to transparency and the simultaneous production of opacity. This parallax between transparency and opacity has time and again surfaced in contemporary writings on the partition. Like Urvashi Bhutalia says, and I'm quoting her, there is no way of knowing what they, meaning the respondents, choose to suppress, or if the stories these people tell are true, quote-unquote true or not, nor of knowing what they, um, <coughs> not of knowing what they are saying or what they are suppressing. How can you know that after four or five decades of the event, the stories are not simply rehearsed performance? or that they are told differently to different people, perhaps to suit what the person thinks the interviewer wishes to hear." Unquote. Here, truth is the truth of play, the truth of interview, the truth of the individual respondent's location at a particular point in personal history vis-a-vis -vis the interviewer. Rana Mama, that is, the author's meaning, Bhutadiya's maternal uncle, decided to stay back in Pakistan. Converted to Islam, and by all evidences, even converted his mother. His life is like a scroll of greed, guilt, and survival. Together, a poetics of survival veiled by a thick coat of silence. 
This is the stuff of politician archive. Traditional approach to memory as the fullness of original, that is, analogous memory true to the immediacy of life and happenings, has no clue of how to deal with memories that precedes occurrences, that is, when things come into being only in their remembrance. Okay? Memory that is predicated on the non-existence of the past. Reversibility is here opposed to retrieval, not the cause effect time you know, embodied in the archive by the time of continuous analeptic, that is, you go back, analeptic and prolepsis mode. You go to the future. That is restoration of the past and anticipation of the future where the appeal is to the truth of desire. A caveat is in place here. In the current posturing, the more memory becomes crystallized into a self-conscious discourse, separated from mainstream history writing, the more is the risk of history being reduced to an unproblematic practice, while memory itself attaining an invulnerable position. You know, this is the, the, the kind of danger of separating memory as a self-conscious discourse. The purpose of my raising this point is to add a note of caution, lest the current celebration of memory juggles in memory as history in place of history as memory. Okay. The caution is particularly necessary since much of the transport of memory discourse comes via its deployment in multicultural identity politics of the West, an altogether different theater, where every ethnic community owns, its own, owns an identity of its own. Third section, violence, trauma. I've already taken 37 minutes. How, how much more do I have? Okay. No, you shouldn't allow me that privilege. <laughs> Violence, trauma, and the texture of every day. It has been argued that by, that by pitting the extraordinary or pure singularity against the banal and everyday, the scholarly literature on Holocaust obscures the habits of thought and social structures that make genocidal practices inevitable. In contrast, the new turn of partition studies from the 1990s by votes on the impact of extraordinary violence at the national level on a quotidian humdrum life, especially on violated women. The studies of Urubashi Butalia and especially Vina Das are focused on the incommunicability that occurrences of massive violence cause at the level of everyday domestic transactions. Both these studies, interestingly, were triggered by the carnage of the Sikhs in Delhi in 1984, that is 37 years after partition violence. In that way, they can be called history of the present, following Walter Benjamin's use of the term, namely a crisis of the past and the crisis of the present coming together to give a new vantage point to expose the course of taken for granted history. The riots of 1984 does in a way open the archive of the partition and brought to open something that survived so long as an unstable, unvisited equilibrium. Vina Das argues that if women where the egregious targets of partition violence, if their violence and abduction were flaunted as the triumph of one community over the other, then by ignoring the violence done to male bodies, the state left its gendered markings on the national psyche, a point that has resonances in other works of ethnography and history of the partition. Violence has an excess that defies representation, a problem common to also those working on the Holocaust subline. 
instead thus patiently traces how the violent event steps into the recesses of the ordinary, delving deep roots into the mundane, quotidian, everyday life. Events that wreak viol extreme violence on families and communities create a potent doubt and unknowability about the social world. The greatest <coughs> uh, <coughs> Causality of uh, sorry casualty of sorry casualty of extraordinary violence is everyday life itself, which loses its grammatical moorings, its known forms of life, resulting in a void in the very language that organizes social life. At this point, let us take a pause and ask: Is there anything like an everyday? Is my today my everyday? Was my yesterday my everyday or my tomorrow? None of the specific days is my everyday. It is an abstraction and like all abstractions, it is all of these days and none. <coughs> Every day is a mode of disciplining the arbitrary that marks each day of our lives and therefore in constant need of that. The residual and the regular of the everyday function as a datum to absorb the irregular, the extraordinary. But to what extent can the everyday absorb the irregular? To investigate this, Das engages in what she calls the vertical sense of the form of life, beyond which it is difficult to recognize human transactions. The social at this point is rendered uninhabitable. What happens to the social, she asks, when a brother is not being able to decipher whether love consisted in killing one sister to save her from another kind of violence from the crowd, or handing her over for protection to someone whose motives one couldn't fully fathom? or a mother's failure to know that her child was safer with her out in the open, you know, in sight of the uh, murderous crowd, rather than hidden in a house with his father. Following Wittgenstein, Das asks, if the subject is a condition of experience, what happens when the experience itself is blurred? How does a subjectivity survive if the boundaries of knowable world are exceeded? Vinadas locates a subject in the long passage through a past of traumatic violence and a present of a sociality that was once so familiar, but you know, now so unknown. When the boundaries, the, when, when the boundaries of the knowable have exploded what happens to subjectivity itself. How can subjectivity function when words have stopped to signify? She heard people speak about the violence and what they experienced with words that seemed so ghostly, or else their voice seemed animated by the voice of some other person. It was as if they spoke words of Hindi or Punjabi translated from some other language. Thus his primary contribution to the discourse of memory in social science, cultural anthropology in particular, is a non-representative approach to memory. Following Wittgenstein, she holds that to see memory in a representation is to freeze in time and space what is particularly a fluid activity spread across both. Going against the storage, retention, and recall thesis, she argues that memory is a dynamic event that only exists in operation. Instead, she emphasizes the interaction between the person and their brain and the environment in which acts of memory are. Hence, over a long period of time, the traumatized can rebuild herself through her interaction with the surrounding in which she is placed. 
past memory and present happenings are not linked in li linear uh, <coughs> causality. The agent plays a language game that links present event with past memory. In other words, brain is an activity, not a repository. So to recall is a judgmental, normative dimension. And the person relates to past and present every time and even. How one links the present with the past is an ethical act. Thus, his patient ethnography tries to underscore the unfolding of this ethics over a long, long passage of time. Now I come to the fourth section, which is called the paradox of witnessing. And those who have visited uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., would have seen, you know, a, uh, the very entrance, a poem and a picture of picture of a huge, almost a hill of shoes of different kinds dumped at one place. You must have seen that. And the poem, I recite that poem by the Yiddish poet Moses Schulstein. And it says, what are the shoes? And it's like, we are the shoes. We are the last witness. We are shoes from grandchildren and grandfathers, from Prague, Paris, and Amsterdam. And because we are made of fabric and leather, and not of blood and flesh, each one of us could avoid the hellfire. So it's, the poem is called, I Saw a Mountain, and is placed at the entrance of Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Giorgio Agamben, contemporary Italian philosopher, has devoted an entire book called Remnants of Auschwitz to the problem of the possibility of witnessing and even of epochal violence like the Holocaust. What interests Agamben in Auschwitz is not so much the pile of shoes or other artifacts that shock the sensibility of the poet or the countless dead bodies strewn all over the camp that numerous films and paintings would later depict. Not the dissection of a skull of living young children in the name of advancement of scientific knowledge that the Holocaust Museum would so graphically sort of illustrate, but a category of inmates known as the Muzalma, you know, the moving threshold in which man passed into non-man, yet performing the bare rituals of living. In the terminology of the camp, Muzalman or in plural Muzalmana manner, were those who have been reduced to a cluster of straggling, stooping corpses, a bundle of physical actions in its last convulsions. They were so called by the camp officials because from afar, one had the impression of seeing Arabs in prayer. The Muslim is the site of an experiment in which morality and humanity are called into question, not extermination as such, but where living becomes the performance of death. Here we confront, again then says, the primary problem of witnessing, or to put it more emphatically, we confront the impossibility of testimony. Can language capture what expired from language? Here also rise the ethical legal project of Oxford. From Premo Levy, himself a camp survivor and subsequently an important commentator um, on the Holocaust, and I'm quoting from him on the problem of witness and survival, comes this very point of impossibility of testimony, impossibility of being, you know, a perfect witness. And he says, I must repeat, we the survivors are not the true witnesses. We survivors are not only an exiguous but also an anomalous minority. 
we are those who by their prevarications or abilities or good luck did not touch the bottle. Those who did so, those who saw the bottle have, have not returned to tell us about it or have returned mute. But they are the Muslims. The Sadmaj. <coughs> But they are the Muslims, the submarch, the complete witnesses, the ones whose deposition would have had a general significance. They are the rule. We are exception. Theodore Adorno began the chapter Metaphysics and Culture of his book's Negative Dialectics, observing a new categorical imperative has been imposed by Hitler upon unfree mankind to arrange their thoughts and actions so that Auschwitz will not repeat itself, so that nothing similar will happen." Unquote. But how can mankind erect this new categorical imperative when epochal violence like that of Holocaust or atomic bombing or for that matter the violence that accompanied the partition remains <coughs> incomprehensible, a metaphysical transcendent. Here again, Agamben returns to a consideration of the intimate connections between language and death. To refigure the legal and ethical status of the only possible witness to Auschwitz, law, law, language, and death must have to be thought and rethought together. The possibility of constructing a language of death which is neither a dead language nor a language of the dead. This is the ethical challenge that the mute impossible witness in the figure of Muslim gives us with. <coughs> All these issues recur in the creative output that followed the partition. Though to some extent, the desire to articulate the nationalist imperative to leave the violence as a past aberration and keep the life of the nation moving, to treat partition violence as a collective insanity that is better forgotten, has had its mark on the literary creative meditations. The creative literature that concerns us here touches on the issue of the possibility or impossibility to witness. Yeah, I have a cold here. I can't be helped with this. However, the primary focus of such writings has been the work of memory and the quotidianization of extraordinary violence, though such is the imbricated nature of such questions that thoughts inevitably lend themselves to issues of witnessing and representation as it does in Holocaust. Manto's bleak ironies discard any optimism regarding the shared culture in the aftermath of collective violence. In his story, The Miracles, a man dumps a bag of sugar, his loot, to a nearby well into which he also fell accidentally and dies. The next morning the villagers found the water of the well into which he dies has turned sweet. Candles are lit at the man's grave at night. To interrogate the body of the nation, the body of literature too, the body of writing needs to be fractured. Hence, in manto, reportage, diary, incoherent narration, doubling of points of view, all blend to accommodate the collective madness that partition had occasioned. The act of colossal absurdity, which includes not only the eruptive violence, but also the derangement of high politics and the banality of bureaucratic logic can only be captured, if at all, 
through the madness of Toba Dixie and other inmates of the asylum, while his death in no man's land is perhaps an indication of the loss of determination of analytical categories through which we think, classify, and discriminate. It seems preposterous to suggest that we can represent by literary or other means the individual horrors of the collective destruction, be it of the final solution or the partition atrocities, in a way that brings the viewer or the reader anywhere near the events themselves. And, with, and yet we have discovered over the decades that representation has been mooted by a flood of words and images and testimonies. That is, the very impossibility to represent triggers more and more and more of representation. The desire to represent what exceeds the regularities of knowledge and the language that would contain it is what Modest Blushaw calls the in hyphen experience of disaster, the inexperience of disaster. This aspiration of grasping what cannot be grasped by language is mooted in the European transcendental philosophy of Edmund Husserl and elaborated by his unfaithful disciple Martin Heidegger. It, do, it draws from the Kantian dichotomy of pure intelligence, which is beyond the circumscribed creaturely intellect of the human, but which also nonetheless can be glimpsed as something other, the ruptural self-disclosure of being. But this glimpse, this disclosure, is only momentary, hence the poria that links the witness and her testimony. Witness is speechless by the sublimity of the event. Testimony is the witness's compulsion to speak. I come to the last phase, uh, which is called Partition Museum and the Life of Objects on the Governance of Memory. Shedding the am amnesic remembrance of past sufferings, partition archives have of late started coming into being in India, most prominently the Partition Museum in Amritsar. Set up by a non-profit NGO, the Arts and Cultural Heritage Trust, which is tucked, part of the town hall has been converted into the museum. It is located in the heritage street of Amritsar leading up to Jalindwalabad and the Golden Temple. The LSE South Asia Center is responsible for intellectual and academic support, asserting the time has come to confront the horrors of partition. Kiswar Desai, chairperson of the museum, explains that museums have been more about collections than experience, museums traditionally, about documentation than memory, about history through objects rather than storytelling. The museum in Amritsar intends to be a people's museum, like, you know, people nation, as I said before based on the recollection of partition victims and survivors and built on materials that they provide. Such museums, be it of Holocaust or partition, are guided by the moral imperative that we remember so that past injustices that inform of present will not be passed over, that we introspect the contingent courses through which we became what we are today. Record voices of precarious lives so long untold or told only to intimate relations as well as quotidian memories and also in a residual sense that justice will be done to the perpetrators of the present. So that, in short, as a commentator of Auschwitz wrote, the injustices of the past remain a guiding dark light to the future. Of necessity, the artifacts and oral histories are charged with personal and moral questions. What effect would the reputation of mnemonic terraces have on the perception of popular history is a question that research needs to delve into. <coughs> Added to this, a 
Now is another question. What effects will such museums have in the cyber age and global lacing of the diaspora? Memory, even as memory of changing space, does not live in void but in relations, not only to other mycological memories but to the broader scenario of collective memory. Maurice Halsworth had classically defined collective memory as an overarching group mind. Contemporary research has, however, taken issue with such holistic and composite idea of collective memory. Collective memory is more like an ensemble of practices and material artifacts that are fluid and open to interventions. It is a participation in a discourse that is speculative and prone to both consolidation and change. It includes archives, public monuments, statues and museums but also pieces of material culture that people venerate from the past, like a scrolling branch of letters, old jaded photographs, even quotidian objects, like, for instance, a broken coal, artifacts imbued with pathos, which are now finding way to the archive. Each partitioned family is quite a veritable archive. One moves freely between memories of individual events to memories of immediate communities, to memories preserved and sponsored by the nation state or corporate capital. This new materialization ensures contest of interpretation and invents new traditions. As Susan Crane observes, not that historical discourses do not use memory, but memory is unhinged there from its social anchorage and becomes an abstract framework of chron chronology and factual details. The new culture of preservation comes from the awareness while artifacts and oral accounts of important happenings are prone to, to be lost. Historical memories as taught in classrooms, history as, as observed in national felicitations and recorded in official documents cannot do justice to collective memory that people live with. Now, after the partition museum, it is quite sure there will be many more of such museums. For instance, installations, exhibitions of partition and subsequent refugee lives are taking place in Kolkata now. Like we had one organized by Najesha Froze a month or so back here at this very premises. What is interesting is the particular point in the life of the partition in which, at which such museumization has started happening. Those who have grown up in the generation of post-memory, that is, after the actual event has taken place but whose effects were everywhere there, people like us, have had to live with broken, forestalled, out of context stories and viewing relations. Through reputation, displacement, and recontextualization, post memory attempts to recreate spaces of the past, to reinvent and redirect them. In contrast, the third generation acquires its knowledge of the partition from representational sources like the television serials, textbooks, novels, newspapers, political party speeches and governmental practices, and also, though increasingly marginally, from family sources. If the second generation is post-memory, I would like to call the third generation post-forgetting, that is, remembering after it has been originally forgotten. Much of this memory is mediatized, for if the first generation, if for the first generation victims, objects that survive were matters of everyday continuity and also occasions for active mourning for those that got lost, for the second generation like myself, they were mnemonic items, ones that were still in use but had a second life as an extension of the stories from the other side of the border that we were brought up used objects of a severed past have a life of their own. They carry a halo of pentimento 
that is, emergence of earlier shades, casting a ghostly shadow on the present's absence drama and offering a glimpse behind the garden of time. Here, the objects are subjects, a sad intimacy scripted into their very materiality. I remember my mother's Hatid Date Chiruni, that is a comb with an ivory coat, with a couple of teeth broken here and there, that came from our lost home on the other side of the border. The objects, no matter how humble, invented a time for us which was neither of the time that existed before the partition, nor of our present, but at an interface of the two, and we love to live in them. While the objects, and this is important, while the objects self-adjusted themselves to the new time. For the third generation, they are relics and part of urbanization. Among the things that survived the partition was the bedstead of my parents. My mother got it as a wedding gift from her parents. It came to this side all right, this side of the border all right, but only after some of the wooden embroidery got broken. I played as a child in, in to those broken you know, places as a child by poking, poking my finger through those inanimate wounds. Recently, without my knowing, one of my brothers fixed those broken parts. After a fresh varnish, the cot now looks new. When I asked him, why did you do it? He replied, Onik din to holo, ar koto. For him, partition is over at long last, perhaps. Here, I would like to quickly mention how after all this long decades, the reminiscence of partition and early hardship in refugee colonies of Bengal are taking the shape of a uniform national narrative, celebrating mostly the upward mobility of this erstwhile refugees. Let me end where I began, that is sightseeing in Dhaka in my friend's car. I had heard of Shakari Bazaar from my mother. Actually, it was a kind of a refrain in a partition, reminiscences. Shakari Bazaar Jato Din Ache, Amra Thik Ache. Je Din Shakari Bazaar Porbo, Bojum Ebar Jaita Hoi Bo. Shakha, as you know, is the conch shell, you know, that bangle made of that, in which Hindu married women wear. I went to see Shakari Bazaar and its labyrinthian lanes on my first visit to Dhaka in 2005. I stood at the entrance of one of those lanes and looked there and looked that perhaps only many stories that preceded it could, could give rise to. Suddenly came to my notice an old man wrapped in a white tan along with, I mean, with a long, neat marking of white sandalwood on his forehead, staring at me. He did not stop looking, said nothing, step by step, came closer. When about 20 feet away, he said in a hushed voice of disapproval, Amagori Dakunen Kisu Hoi Nai, Bipo de Porse Vuiza, Nijer Mare Chaira Pala Yangle, Jodi Dakunen Hoi, Nijo Goro that is, there's nothing to look at us. Knowing that she is in trouble, you left to your own mother and ran away. If there is anyone to look at, look at yourself. The mortifying gaze kept looking at me and left the place. I wonder what the objects that survived the partition violence mean to this man now. Is it the same as ours? To what extent the meaning of objects of past will be determined by one's location in history's mess? What could museumization of objects, open to all viewers from all lands, mean culturally and politically? These are points to ponder. Thank you.
Yeah, I mean, I was trying to point that out. The, obviously, the ideological functions, you know, of historiography of Indian partition and that of Holocaust are very different. And actually, as I was trying to point out within a very short span, that uh, that location of the ideological impetus for understanding, disseminating, and more than that, forming a whole populace, a whole you know, people nation around the memories of Holocaust, that itself has gone through different phases. You know, initially <coughs> it was Holocaust victims laced with the, the different uprisings in the camps, particularly Warsaw Uprising, and also the young people who were killed in the fights in the first decade with, with the Arabs. So that was the center. But gradually it shifted to, you know, make first of all the, uh, the Holocaust as not so much as a victimhood, but as a glorious resistance. And also, to bring down the emphasis on such events as the Warsaw Cato uprising. Because what Israel was doing to Palestine would then have a different meaning altogether. And now the main question that has come is how to actually you know, shape the younger generation who are no more interested in all this. You know, for different reasons for both what Israel's you know, role has been and there are in fact writings coming from within Israel of this preterm predator syndrome that is happening there and also because Israel has by now become a post-industrial quite a you know like advanced and, and uh, affluent country people do not want to give their lives there. So what will happen with partition, you know, uh, historiography uh, is now very interesting because, you know, if you go into partition literature, this whole thrust into inwardness, this whole question of witnessing happened at the very beginning, creative writing, but that wasn't sort of caught up by the historical and anthropological writings that were happening. In fact, there was hardly any anthropological writing happening on the partition. That all started from the 1990s. And now we have the museums coming up. So what happens, you know, particularly when the third generation of partition families are you know, on the fourth? So that is something to be seen, speculated. Yep. Thank you, Manish. Uh, sorry, I missed the first part of it. Um, <clears throat> I had, I want to make a couple of points, but just to follow up on what uh, Aditi had just asked, I think to dealing partition from the memorialization of Holocaust would be important. And I'm increasingly thinking of this because so much of the modes in which why we need a memorial and a museum to partition, it's always been justified in terms of that it was a human tragedy of a scale that, if not on the same scale as the Holocaust, nonetheless requires. 
But nonetheless, because the format and the larger ways in which Holocaust memorialization has now had a very long history and has itself come under critique, I do believe that the ways in which the new forms of memorialization of partition will be happening, perhaps from this moment onwards, may need to rethink why partition was not the Holocaust and therefore why the wound, the guilt, the sense of betrayals have been very differently played out. So that's just a larger comment. I think so much of this idea of the parallelism between the two, I think it's continuously now something to think about. I mean, there are many other kinds of uh, forms of memorialization of trauma, loss, that one could think about. But the questions I had was for the part that I did uh, listen to, was around, uh, which you very evocatively raised, on the act of witnessing and uh, the muteness of witnessing. So which almost seemed to suggest, and I think you did suggest that, that therefore inanimate objects, and that links with the last part of your paper, that in many ways inanimate objects, remnants that were often directly from the body, the physical presence, the physical, you know, that physical index almost of the victim and the remnants where the shoes were. All things that were belong to larger sense of households which have been displaced and lost. But often it's now being thought that objects and to place objects as mute witnesses may do the work that human testimony was never able to perform or that human testimony could not perform. Could they could the impossibility of testimony to do. So I just wanted to for you to think about that, which is why uh, now to return to that inanimate uh, and to make the inanimate speak through their muteness, through museums, through memorializations, through books, through forms of retrieval, has become now in a way, while you are making people speak, while memory, collecting memories was the moment that marked partition studies of the 80s, mid 80s onwards, now, particularly because those from whom you could collect memories are no more, so in those uh, 25 years and more that have gone. Um, now, increasingly, the turn is to think about objects. So I, want, I wanted your reflection on that particularly. And uh, finally, the point is that what happens to memory uh, if memory is not spoken about? Because the assumption here, when you say the brain is more uh, I think you use the word more process rather than a repository, right? Uh, so that the brain is uh, always an active. But, uh, you know, a lot of the, when the 1984, post-84 projects of collecting memories, collecting all the narratives within, it was as if those memories had remained there all the time and they had never been spoken about because of the difficulties <coughs> of speaking about them. But nonetheless, they were there. They were they deposited it in the brain, uh, but there was no active ways of recharging them. So I sometimes wonder that we think of memory always through now the lens of the orality of speech, of remembrance, or acts of remembrance of different kinds. But what do we think of the newness of memory to? And therefore, for all that has been spoken, there must be so much that has never been spoken about. And you know, I was just thinking, and those layers may remain, I mean, particularly in terms of what another generation inherits as memories, uh, are largely through either oral histories, you know, stories, or sometimes through just things that are around. But I was just wondering about memories that have remained mute and that will never be well, uh, um, extremely useful questions. Uh, first, the Holocaust partition kind of debate. I think, you know, <coughs> the main, the first thing that we should remember is the difference in nature of 
Holocaust kind of violence and partition kind of violence. Because in Holocaust, one community was hounded by another community. While in partition, it was the act of two or three communities, you know. Uh, so it is much more insidious in the case of uh, the as but said, there are no clear perpetrators. There are no clear perpetrators here. Everyone is, perpetrator, everyone is a perpetrator, everyone is a prey. So how are we, are we then not going to have any memorialization of partition? I think here is the way you locate these memories and the, and the memorialization. Like how, you know, what led to partition? outside the big national actors, what led to that violence, the everyday structure of it, and the everyday taboos that you know, went into the making of a kind of alienation between communities. That is, that is how you mount that museum is so important in the case of you know, partition. And that makes it also very vulnerable because it you know, it can invite many kinds of political interests coming within it. But, you know, holo once the holo I mean, partition museum has started coming, I think it will only proliferate for at least some more time. Because the distance from uh, partition is now a safe distance. At the same time, there are provocations to see that distance is sort of shortened. So this to tension will actually help it. Now, objects, yes, objects, objects, because, you know, objects have a peculiar advantage over language, constructed language, is that the object doesn't have to go through that constructed grammatical bindings, you know, which implicitly put some sort of restrictions or put some pointers in the way the signification is going to happen. So one object can trigger so many things in you, but it also means what is an advantage is also a disadvantage at another level, because that object, that hatid that chironi, what it means to me, might not mean anything at all to another person from another background or another generation who has actually overcome that situation. You know, and. There also comes in the problem of making you know, the, the refugee, the partition victim, both an exotic figure and an universalized figure. You know, like seeing that comb here in Bengal and seeing a similar sort of thing in Bosnia, maybe in some museum, it, it, it has the tendency of universalizing it to a person who was not party to that experience. See, but yes, objects can tell you a lot more than you know any written account because the written account is eliminated because of the split I talked about between the witness and the testimony. What happens when language itself expires from itself? What happens then? So that way. And what was your final question, Dr. About memories that remain unspoken. So you were yeah. talking about the brain as being yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I remember. Rather than a yeah, but so, you know, so much remains in that repository which will die with the person itself. Absolutely. But the thing to look at it is memory is a kind of representation. The same room here, just as in photography, I can have so many different angles and me and give rise to so many different stories of the same thing. Memory is too, depending on your present location will have very different representations by the same person over a period of time. Yeah. So this is my you know, instant reaction to that otherwise very complex question.
I just wanted to know how would you place uh, Anderson's work of you know imagining community first because it was coming all throughout the, while listening to the various references that you were talking about. So how would you place that work in terms of people's nation and what relation they could possibly have? Thank very you. very interesting. You know, people nation I'm putting vis-a-vis -vis nation state. That nation state is that kind of formal state operatic view of both the nation and the people. While more and more what we are finding that the nation state has to respond from the surges that are coming from below. And what, you know, a short end term we say, you know, populism for some, you know, like. You see the, uh, the current direction of India for that matter, any other country, is a kind of response to what I am calling nation state. I'm uh, sorry, people nation. Yeah. So in that sense, I'm I'm, I'm putting it. You no, know, uh, it is both similar and very different from Anderson, because when Anderson talks of an imagined community, if you remember, he is doing that as a kind of bridge between what I am calling people nation and nation state. Here I am by calling it people nation. I am sort of putting uh, the people nation, the people as such, at the grassroots, at the at the helm of things. Because you know, imagine community. One must also remember is actually a disciplining yeah, yeah. Uh, activity. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Can, can memory be also very selective when you when you you know? Uh, what uh, they say about unsafe memory, mm -hmm. which remains new, it always remains new, if not expressed. But isn't when memory is uh, revived, memory is resurrected? It's often selective because, uh, and memory may not be in that sense. We are slightly unsure, full of history, you know, using memory indiscriminately without reading between the lines. Uh, do have its uh, yeah, absolutely. Memory is always selective. Like uh, it's like representation in many ways. You know, you because you have so many ways of representing this room, you are ultimately selective. Yeah. So memory is also and memory is particularly so because memory also runs a risk. You know, uh, so you are selecting it from your present strategic. In a location, so it also be manufactured to an extent. Yeah, it is manufactured, and the pro at the problem at times is that you yourself might not know that you are manufactured. Yeah. Absolutely true. Like uh, last year, when Independent India turned 70, BBC ran a two day program on partition of India. Not even once was mentioned <coughs> that the country was partitioned in the East as well. So, like any other celebration, this one too is closely linked with you know people who are close to power and also the way the corporate capital is moving. 
but any exclusion also creates resistances. Like we here are saying, why aren't we represented adequately in Amritsar Museum? We are not mentioning why has not this been mentioned at all. I mean, I don't think there is any reference to not this in that museum, though there are one or two from Bengal. So that also creates a space for resistance. Then I'm sure there will be resistances from not this. And this tension will keep continuing, keep continuing. You know, one after another book after this 90s thing, they don't even mention, you know, which comes from Delhi, they don't even mention uh, Bengal partition at all. Like translating partition, out of 18 articles there, there is only one small article in Bengal partition. Can I come to this? Yeah. Uh, see, uh, there is also a problem of, you know, a clamor for a space to be heard, a clamor for representation. It's also interesting that if by Bengal feel sidelined by Punjab, the Northeast feel sidelined by Bengal, Punjab and Bengal. Different caste groups have felt sidelined in a story of largely upper class, upper caste. I mean, say within the story of the Bengal partition, there's a very prominent sense in which other castes have not, and their stories have been rather different. But I'm just wondering that if 70 years after the event, in one sense we are talking about forms of closure so that other forms of memorializations can happen. As you mentioned with a bit about the broken bedstead, <coughs> somewhere you have to tell yourself the scars now have to be either forgotten. So the bed, I presume the making of the new bedstead is a sign uh, less that your brother uh, has forgotten, but more that he feels is no point now retaining the physical notion of the scar. The reason I'm saying is that while all of this is very important, we know that scholarship, for instance, Malini Shu's work, is looking very closely at the nature of the border and border, you know, being all over the Northeast and these kinds of questions. And I think elements of now, uh, sections of academic work is now, particularly work in the Northeast, is increasingly looking at the much longer impact of what, you know, partition meant and what all of this meant. But I'm saying that while that work can happen, how far that academic work or that kind of ethnographic work that may be happening uh, will find a larger representation within what you're calling national narratives on partition uh, will, of course, become the problem. So in many ways, it becomes about the story of the nation, right? That it is about a retrospective claim for finding a representational space in that story. Uh, and, but I'm wondering since in this case, uh, so the entire nature of, say, the political life has been driven by the fact that we do have a claim on it. So I'm just wondering that in terms of unearthing stories of more and more exclusions, uh, what would be, you know, in some ways at the representational thing, the fact that if we were to say there was no single partition, there were many, many partitions, and therefore what partition would mean in every pocket. So there is not even just Bengal and Punjab, that within Bengal there would be so many different registers. And then if you look at the Northeast, if you look at Assam, you look at Manipur, uh, you even consider Burma and that thing, there would be different registers. So maybe I think the question to raise is that whether they can at all be a common representational frame which can ever encompass the partition. Right? So mm -hmm. I think that would be No, that, that's a very valid thing. And you know, another big divide which actually links up with what you were saying, for Bengal and North East, it's not a kind of uh, <coughs> retrospective, you know, claim. I mean yeah, a claim for a retrospective recovery. Now. Because for us it's so a continuing it's, thing. It's a, it's a war on the present, you know. Um, you say any war on, on the Northeast and like, say, uh, or Bengal border, like 
will have mentioned those. You know, the, the party border as livelihood. That shows that it is very much in the present. But what what the other day, you know, I heard Dr. something Dr. and Dr. Dr.'s book is also going to be coming out on boundaries and borders. Boundaries and borders, which will be again on a very, very uh, current, continuing scenario. So, these two historiographies are actually very different, even in their basic nature and basic kind of attention. But somehow, you know, the other day I heard a comment which I would like to share uh, from someone who thinks it's all right to have a recent, you know, partition museum only on Punjab because uh, I was told that you guys have already monopolized 19th century. Let us do this. <laughs> <laughs> Let us do this. Thank you very much. It was a very, very good experience.